Good afternoon, Space Cadets, or I should say good evening. It's definitely dark where I am. I don't know about y'all. Welcome to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Patrick Hess, your Planetarium Specialist, and this is my sidekick, Phoebe. And we are here for another Monday night live stream. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for joining us. If you're a uh, first-time watcher, we're so happy to have you. We are live streaming on the Union Station Facebook page, as well as the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's Facebook page. So if you haven't yet, be sure to head on, head on over there to like and subscribe to get all of your space updates there. If you're a returning watcher, thanks for uh, joining us yet again. Thanks for all of you, uh, our hardcore fans, who have been watching from the very beginning. We've been live streaming all the way back since March, and we are hitting a big milestone stone today this is our 50th live stream can you believe it very exciting and i'm so happy to have been doing this uh over the past eight months nine months however long it's been and uh we're planning on continuing these for a little while longer now don't forget this is a live live stream uh and if you are watching on facebook be sure to uh, add a comment and say hi give a shout out let us know where you're watching from we love to see where everybody's tuning in from and if you have any questions throughout the stream be sure uh, to post those there as well now, this is our 50th stream, and I wanted to take a just a moment to thank everybody uh, for their continued support. Of course, watching these streams and sharing them with your friends is a huge way to help Union Station. As a reminder, Union Station and the Planetarium are open to the public right now. Uh, so if you'd like to come uh, see one of our live star tours and feel comfortable with that, of course, then we would love to have you. You can buy tickets online, and we, of course, are following all the safety protocols as outlined by the mayor of Kansas City. Also, don't forget that you can support Union Station in many other ways. In fact, if you want to learn more about how you can support Union Station, head on over to unionstation.org slash donate and there's a lot of information there about different ways you can donate there are a bunch of different funds you can donate to so if you'd like to help our education fund to continue these programs for the science center and planetarium uh, you can uh, donate there you can donate to the Pres preservation fund union station is 105 106 year old a building and it uh, takes a lot of resources to keep Union Station operational and to keep that beautiful building uh, shining as a beacon for Kansas City. Uh, so please consider donating uh, if you would like, if you are able, uh, and that uh, helps out Union Station a lot and it helps keep programs like this going. Of course, watching us helps keep programs like this going as well. And we already got a couple people tuning in and commenting. Uh, Eric Hess, one of our longtime watchers, of course, is saying a Yahoo. Thanks for watching, Eric. Uh, Deborah says hello, and Casey says hello again, Patrick. And Union Station. Thank you so much, all of you, for watching. Uh, once again, don't forget this is a live live stream, uh, and we are going to uh, jump in. Oh, one more comment is coming in from Emily. Emily says hi, Patrick, and hi, Phoebe. And Phoebe actually is uh, sort of part of the live stream today because today's live stream, today's deep dive topic, is going to be all about the moon, Earth's moon, to be specific. Now we've talked about a lot of moons during our streams. In fact, I did a whole stream of my top 10 moons. If you want to check that out, that is the uh, September 14th live stream, which you can find on our YouTube channel. Just search for Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium uh, and you'll find us there. Uh, but I did mention, if you watch that stream, you may remember that I mentioned that uh, I was intentionally leaving the Earth's moon out of that list because it really deserved its own live stream. And we've covered so many other topics of our solar system. We've covered many of the planets. We've covered Mars, Venus, um, uh, Mercury. We've covered the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. We've talked about uh, many of the moons of our solar system. We've talked about minor planets and dwarf planets and comets, pretty much everything except for the moon, honestly. Uh, so we are going to give the moon its due and talk about Earth's nearest neighbor today. And uh, speaking of Phoebe, as I mentioned, she's part of the stream uh, because I actually named Phoebe after the moon. Phoebe is a Greek uh, titaness. Uh, one of the titans were the, uh, the, titans were the uh, rulers of the heavens to the Greeks uh, before the Olympians, before Zeus and his family came in. And Phoebe was a titaness who represented the moon. And I thought Phoebe's gray and pink coloring reminded me of the moon, especially lunar eclipses. And we're going to talk about lunar eclipses uh, at uh, some point in our stream. And Phoebe's getting a little bitey, so she gets to go back to her cage. Uh, so everybody say goodbye to Phoebe. Phoebe, say bye to everybody. Uh, she uh, is very thankful uh, to join us. She, in fact, she's doing a little yoga pose for you right there. Wow, very nice, Phoebe. All right, we'll be right back, folks. Say bye, Phoebe. Let's see how angry she gets. All right, actually... <laughs> Because she did such a great job, uh, she's going to get some treats. Ooh, boy. 
There you go. And if there was any doubt we were doing this live, then hopefully that put those doubts at ease. All right, we got a bunch of other people chiming in. Uh, looks like Chris is chiming in saying, hey, Patrick. Hey, Chris, thanks so much uh, for watching yet again. One of our uh, top fans for sure. Amanda says, hey, watching from Kearney, Missouri. Awesome. Donald tunes in. Uh, the, and Donald is saying, tell Jim Masplin to say, or I said hello. Okay, well, hello to both of you. Uh, Sherry is watching, uh, says... Uh, uh, gives a, a lovely cat emoji and says that meow, uh, very nice. And if I had a cat here, that cat would be featured in the stream as well. Linda says, watching from Belton. Awesome. Cindy, watching for the first time. Thanks for watching, Cindy. We're so glad you're joining us. Hope you enjoy this stream today. And don't forget, there are 40 other, 49 other past live streams. Uh, so if you enjoy this one, you can go back and rewatch some of our older ones. Covered a lot of fun topics. Uh, Selena says hello. Amber says hello. Dee Dee says that they enjoy the live streams. And uh, Jerry says hello from Lake of the Ozarks. Amber says hi. Lisa says hello from Leavenworth. Everybody's tuning in. Awesome. Uh, and Emily says the moon is their favorite celestial body. So let's dive in. I always ramble too much at the beginning of these streams. Uh, so we are going to jump into the moon. As I said, it deserves its own live stream. We're going to talk about it today. And keep those comments coming and keep the questions coming for sure. Uh, we'll take a break uh, in a little bit and check back in the comments. And I lo I'm loving the interaction. I'm loving everybody watching. It makes it more fun for me. Other otherwise, it feels like I'm just talking to an endless void, um, which I do uh, for the 23 other hours of the day. So <laughs> it's lovely to talk to all of you virtual humans right now. Uh, and for the next hour, we're going to talk about the moon. So let's go over just some general facts about the moon. And we're going to use a bunch of different software today. Uh, we are going to start over with Space Engine, which is our 3D model of the universe. We can post a link in the comments if you're curious about this software. It's pretty great. And it, of course, has the moon. The moon. The moon is the largest moon in our solar system relative to its parent body. So relative to the Earth, it is one of the, or it is the largest uh, moon. It is not the largest moon in general. There are some moons that are larger than it, and we will compare their sizes. But let's just take a look at that beautiful moon. It's 240,000 miles away on average. It has an elliptical orbit, so sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's further. And it orbits the Earth every 27 days. So uh, one day on the moon lasts about one Earth month. And there, that's not a coincidence. So we will talk a little bit more about uh, the relationship of months to the moon. Um, let's kind of look at some size comparisons. Now, this software is really cool. It actually has a feature that lets us compare all the objects in our solar system by size. Uh, so we are uh, comparing their sizes here. Uh, and of course, all the planets are quite large. But we can see the moon here. Uh, relative to the other bodies in our solar system. And as we can see, there are a number of moons that are larger than our moon. Uh, Io and Callista, Callisto, uh, two moons of Jupiter, along with Ganymede as well here, um, are uh, bigger than our moon. And then Titan, one of Saturn's moon, is, is bigger as well. Uh, but then after that, it's just planets all the way up, Mars being the next largest body. Uh, but you can see the moon is still pretty large relative to our solar system. And relative to the planets, uh, the, this distance is kind of interesting. I'm going to go back over here. So here's just kind of a closer view of uh, comparing some of the moon's sizes. Uh, but here's a kind of a fun fact, uh, just a coincidence that the distance between the Earth and the moon uh, is wide enough that you could fit every planet side by side between it and you'd still have about 5,000 miles to spare. So that's how far away the moon is. So it's kind of crazy when you look up at the moon, it seems like it's pr pretty close, but uh, in re reality, it's actually pretty far away. And uh, this just gives you a sense of the scale of our solar system. Um, now, it is tidally locked, as I mentioned, which means one side always faces the Earth. Uh, but because the moon uh, experiences uh, phases of the moon, uh, so it goes through a different uh, a cycle, not one side is always light or dark. So sorry, Pink Floyd fans, there is no such thing as a dark side of the moon. There's a far side of the moon because the far side always faces away from the Earth. Uh, and then the close side, the near side of the moon, faces towards us. But as we watch the moon go in phases, it, it uh, experiences a day-night cycle, just like the Earth does. And during that day-night cycle, um, the, uh, the temperature ranges can be quite extreme because the moon has no atmosphere. Uh, temperatures range from 250 degrees Fahrenheit in the daytime all the way down to minus 208 Fahrenheit at night. Yikes, very chilly. Um, and uh, some other just kind of facts to throw out there relative to the Earth. It's about... Uh, 7.5% the surface area of the Earth. So this is just comparing uh, by size here. Uh, if we superimposed a map of the moon onto the Earth, so you can see it pretty small. Uh, you could almost drive across the moon if you uh, were on there with a, 
uh, with a moon car. Um, although it is uh, not, it, well, although it's 7.5% the surface area, it's only 1% the mass of the Earth. So it has a much lower mass and about 60% of density. So it's less dense as well. And it's about 27% the diameter. Um, and uh, now, interestingly, the moon has about one-sixth of the gravity of Earth, which might be counterintuitive. If you think about it, it's 1% of the mass of the Earth and mass uh, is related to gravity. Well, it's not just mass uh, that kind of goes into this gravity calculation. Uh, because the moon is smaller, you're closer to the moon's center of mass. So if you're standing on the moon, you would experience a different type of pull of gravity. And, and it kind of works out that way. So even though the moon is uh, just 1% of the Earth's mass, because if you stood on the moon, you were closer to its center, you would still experience one-sixth of its gravity, not like 1% of the gravity. Uh, so here's a really cool uh, visualization that I wanted to show off. Uh, this is, uh, we can put a link to this uh, in the comments, but this is a website uh, someone created, um, I, an artist I believe, uh, somebody just put this together and basically it's a scale model of the solar system uh, imagining if the moon were one pixel. So if we if we scroll here, it'll start with the sun and it goes in order, but then the top here comes uh, with uh, this little legend. And so we'll uh, go on ahead and just zoom on over to the earth. And so we can see uh, the, this is a great visualization to sort of start to comprehend these cosmic distances, the distances between uh, all the planets. And you can see the moon and the earth. Uh, if the moon were just one little pixel on your screen, uh, we have to scroll quite a ways to get to the next planet, Mars. And then it also has some other details, uh, some fun facts in, in between. So, you know, spend an afternoon just kind of scrolling through the solar system here. Also, I wanted to mention, um, if you've... Uh, ever visited downtown Kansas City or haven't, um, then check out Baltimore Street because on Baltimore Street, starting at about 11th or 12th, there is a scale model of the solar system. And you can actually walk from about 12th and Baltimore down to Union Station. It actually ends at Union Station and it has different placards uh, with all the different planets to scale. So you can kind of walk these uh, this uh, solar system scale uh, in downtown. And they, there's not really a website for it, otherwise I'll show you, I'd show you. But again, that's about 12th and Baltimore that has that scale. Um, I, I think right now Jupiter is missing because somebody may have run it over, <laughs> but, but the rest of the solar system is still there. Um, so uh, that's a fun little uh, scale demonstration. Let's talk a little bit about the composition of the moon. It's pretty similar to Earth's uh, composition. It's a partially molten core um, and it has um, a pretty thin crust uh, covered in regolith, which we'll talk about later. Now, uh, there was a discovery announced last month that uh, the moon has as much as 600 million metric tons of water ice on it. Uh, so there is actually, uh, you know, the similarities don't just stop at the rocky material. There is actually water on the moon. It is frozen uh, and a lot of it is stuck at the poles, so it's a bit harder to get to. But it's still pretty cool that there is water on the moon. Uh, it does. Uh, oh, so here's another. Uh, this is a great uh, kind of example of how its composition is similar to Earth's. Um, so we have green, uh, this green bar shows the concentrations of these um, molecules. So this is molecular oxygen, not like atmospheric oxygen. Um, and compared to different regions on the moon, like the lunar lowlands and highlands here in uh, red and black. So you can see it's pretty similar to Earth's composition. Let's talk a little bit about the phases of the moon. Um, now, as the moon orbits the Earth, uh, its, uh, its angle to the sunlight will change, and as we look at the moon, we will see that uh, appear as phases. Uh, and, of course, when the moon is dark, we call that a new moon. The moon starts to get brighter. It becomes a waxing moon. And then when it's half full, it's a first quarter moon, since it's one quarter of the way through its cycle. More than half full, it's what we call a gibbous moon, and then a full moon, of course, halfway through its cycle, and then it wanes as it gets dimmer. There are some tricks you can use to remember the phases or to try to identify them. When you see the moon up in the sky, um, imagine uh, the, a lowercase letter, if we draw a line right here, um, we can make a lowercase b, or we can make a lowercase d. So if you see a lowercase b, then you know the moon is getting bigger. And if you see a lowercase d, then you know the moon is decreasing in size or getting dimmer or something like that. Now be careful, this only works in the northern hemisphere. If you're in the southern hemisphere, this is flipped upside down, as most things are down there. One other weird and wacky thing the moon does is this thing called libration. Uh, so the moon is not perfectly tidally locked. It actually sort of changes its angle due to a couple different things, um, such as its elliptical orbit interacting with its uh, rotation or orbital velocity, as well as uh, tidal forces actually from the Earth pulling on it. So technically we can see as much as 59% of the moon. So you can see it's not just one side of the moon, we actually get just a little bit on the edge as it sort of librates around like that. And you can see also it getting closer and further away. 
Uh, when the moon is at its closest point and it's full at the same time, we call that a supermoon. And then when it's at its farthest point, that's a mini moon. Uh, so every time you hear a supermoon pop up on the news, uh, those are actually pretty common. Generally, we expect about three supermoons a year, uh, and they usually come in sets of three. Uh, so uh, oftentimes the news media has just short attention span or memory, and they kind of forget about that. And so they'll they'll call out the planetarium and say, oh my gosh, there's a supermoon. Is that really rare? And I feel really bad because I get to pour cold water and say, well, it's very cool, but not exactly rare. Still very cool, though. Um, when a moon is at its supermoon phase, so it's the closest and it happens to be a full moon, uh, then it's uh, about 30% brighter, but only about 14% larger. Uh, so it's not really noticeably larger, but it is very bright for sure. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the moon today specifically is because there was a lunar eclipse this morning, in fact. Now, uh, don't worry, uh, don't get any FOMO if you missed out on this one because it wasn't a super exciting lunar eclipse. In fact, it was the most boring type of lunar eclipse, what we call a penumbral eclipse. Basically, the uh, moon passed uh, through the shadow of the Earth, but only sort of the edge of the shadow, not the, the good part of the shadow. Now, uh, a total lunar eclipse, when the moon passes through this uh, central part of the shadow, the part we call the umbra, uh, it becomes blood red because of light refracting off of the Earth's atmosphere, similar to why sunsets are red. Uh, and those blood moons are really awesome. Uh, but this one wasn't super exciting. In fact, it was even just a partial penumbral eclipse. So literally the most boring type of lunar eclipse possible. Um, and again, don't get FOMO because eclipses are actually fairly common. Uh, let's go back over to Space Engine here and back to our normal view. Um, now, you would think if the moon orbited the Earth, and the Earth orbited the Sun in a flat disk, then shouldn't we have eclipses every time there's a full or a new moon, when the moon is sort of aligned between the Earth and the Sun? Well, the answer is no, because the moon is not perfectly lined up with the uh, orbit of uh, the Earth. So if I line up uh, the Earth and the moon here, we will be able to see that the moon is actually sort of orbiting sort of at a, a, a canted angle, sort of a... Uh, a slight angle there, and it's not perfectly lined up with the ecliptic, the plane of the ecliptic. In fact, if I could turn off, let's see actually, I'm not sure I can turn off the other orbits, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so it's gonna kind of hard to see with all the other planet orbits, but hopefully you can see that. So basically the Earth and the uh, Sun's orbital plane is like this, and the Earth and the Moon's orbital plane is at a different angle. Now that means that uh, it's just a bit more rare for the uh, Earth, Moon, and Sun to align. In fact, there's a special name for this uh, alignment of three bodies in space. It's called a syzygy, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y. So that's a fun, uh, fun word of the day for you. So a syzygy is any alignment of three bodies in space. Um, and this will happen about twice a year for both lunar and solar eclipses. Um, so eclipses aren't that rare. What's rare though is being in the right place at the right time because um, for lunar eclipses, you can see them over a kind of a wide region. So you can see this eclipse is visible pretty, visible pretty much in all of North America for its entirety. Um, but for solar eclipses, those are a bit harder to spot. So here's a map of solar eclipses over the next uh, just about 20 years. And you can see they're all over the place and a lot of them will happen over the oceans. So uh, they're pretty rare and hard to spot. The next exciting one that will actually be going close to us, uh, sort of in uh, southeastern Missouri, will be in April of 2024. Uh, so that'll be uh, pretty exciting and visible. Uh, there is an annular eclipse, a solar eclipse that will be happening in, uh, it's a bit fuzzy, but I think it's 2023, uh, and those are a bit different. So here's just kind of a chart showing you the different types of solar eclipses. Now because uh, the moon is just the right size and just the right distance, um, the moon can basically perfectly cover the sun. So this is kind of a cool, rare, uh, and uh, kind of weird scenario that we've uh, that we've found, find ourselves in as a planet, I guess, for lack of a better uh, phrase. Uh, basically, even though the moon is 400 times closer to the Earth than the sun, it's also 400 times uh, narrow and narrow, narrower in angular diameter, which means it appears about the same size as the sun uh, in our sky, and that's why it can perfectly cover up the sun. And that perfect uh, covering of the sun. Oh, this is uh, sorry. This is lunar eclipses. Um, where are the, oh, uh, I missed my graphic of the solar eclipses. Uh, that's okay. So um, 
let's actually, let me just uh, go back over here. So a, a total solar eclipse is when the moon completely covers the sun. An annular solar eclipse is when the moon is farther away, uh, sort of in its, its, the farthest part of its elliptical orbit when it uh, aligns with the sun. And so it doesn't completely cover the sun and there's a ring around it. That's where the term annular comes from. Uh, so that the next solar eclipse we'll see here will be an annular eclipse. Should, st should still be pretty cool. Um, now, there was a really famous solar eclipse back in 2017, August 21st, 2017. In fact, that's what my shirt is all about with the invisible E there. Um, and uh, this was a really spectacular event. Uh, if you saw that eclipse, uh, chime into the comments and we'll check the comments here in a section. But if you got to see that eclipse, let us know um, and tell us your experience watching that uh, North American eclipse. It was pretty spectacular. I was really lucky I got to see it here in down now, downtown Kansas City. And of course, Union Station uh, put an event on for that. Um, if you would like to learn more about uh, this uh, particular eclipse, NASA has a really great visualization tool uh, called NASA Eyes, uh, which let me see if I can get it for you. Uh, you can uh, download NASA Eyes for yourself. It's a free uh, computer app. Uh, there may be a mm, mobile app, but don't take my word for it. Ooh, there we go. Um, so this has a, a really cool visualization of this eclipse, and you can uh, kind of watch as this uh, this view Across the Earth, so there was a very narrow swath that just happened to cross right through Kansas City, um, where you could see the total eclipse. But pretty much everybody in North America could see part of the eclipse here. Uh, but of course, us in Kansas City, it got to line up just perfectly. Um, so you can view different places, like Houston. You can see that it wasn't quite lined up, um, and uh, New York as well. So we were really lucky in Kansas City. Um, so. Yeah, those are eclipses. So don't feel bad about missing last night's eclipse. It, again, it wasn't super exciting. Um, in fact, let's go back over here. So this is kind of pictures of what lunar eclipses would be like. So a penumbral lunar eclipse, the moon only gets a slightly dimmer. A uh, partial lunar eclipse, uh, the moon will get partially shaded. Uh, but when the moon is completely shaded, it's really cool because the moon will start to get darker and darker and darker. And it seems like it's going to go out. But then once the moon is completely covered, suddenly it becomes blood red. Uh, and it's really awesome. If you've seen a lunar eclipse, let us know too. We've watched a couple of them actually at Union Station. Um, I did a few events a few years ago uh, to watch some of these. Uh, there was a, a, a bunch of total lunar eclipses all in a row back in like 2014, 2015 that were really spectacular. Um, so, so that is some general facts about the moon. Let's jump back over to our comments and see what people are saying. Savannah says, hey, from Alabama, my husband took me to Union Station a few years ago. It was beautiful and we loved it during Christmas time. That's so excellent, Savannah. We'll be uh, going back when we want to take our kiddos. That's so great. Well, uh, Union Station is really spectacular during the holidays. Uh, and we really have uh, done it up this year. If you haven't heard yet, there's a spectacular holiday experience uh, at Union Station. So uh, be sure to check that out. It's brand new this year and bigger than ever. Uh, Jen says, Wilson and Lily say, uh, and Andrew say hi. Well, hello, Wilson, Lily, and Andrew. Thanks for watching. A patient says hiya, and I say hiya back. Um, Sarah uh, goes through the emoji moon phases. Thank you, Sarah, for providing that. Uh, Gage says, watching from Corpus Christi, Texas. That's so awesome, Gage. Thanks for tuning in. Kelly, watching from Indianapolis, Indiana. Hometown is KC. Go KC. Uh, Amy says, hello from KCK. I'm a Kansas boy myself. Uh, Phoebe is a cutie. Thanks, Patty. She knows it. Uh, <laughs> Rachel says, a full moon night uh, is a good time to talk about the moon. Yes, so uh, it is a full moon, uh, and this is a great time to talk about the moon. Patient says, I cannot believe that I fell asleep during the lunar eclipse last night this morning, but it was uh, so bright. Uh, don't worry, like I said, patients, it wasn't super awesome. Uh, and uh, we'll actually talk about, uh, in just a second, after I go through the comments, I'll show you where you can learn about where when the next lunar eclipse will be. Kelly says, hello, watching from Indianapolis, uh, in with my family. Well, hello, Kelly and Kelly's family. Thanks for watching. Amber says, I saw the eclipse on the Katy Trail. Ooh, I bet that was really fun. That's awesome, Amber. Uh, Sarah and, oh, Sarah's nephew was born on the eclipse. Ooh, does your nephew have superpowers? Uh, Selena says, I remember it was super cool. Patient says, oh, yes, all of Columbia Public Schools allowed us to be outside for it. That's so great. I really loved hearing some of the schools let students out because that was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. The next time a total solar eclipse crosses over all of the United States will be in like 200 years or something. 
Emily says, standing by our scope at Science City, we saw the diamond and it was amazing. Uh, Melinda says, got together with my daughter and granddaughter. It was awesome to witness. Got a couple questions in the comment section as well. Don't forget to put your questions in the comments and I'll answer those. Uh, Jelana, if I'm saying your name right, says, uh, how do we know the tides were affected by the moon? That's a great question. Uh, so the moon does create the tides. I'm glad you bring that up because I didn't have a slide for it. Um, but uh, the moon causes the tides and it's basically the moon's gravity pulling on the Earth's oceans. Uh, and the tides correspond with the, uh, the moon's position as well. And so you can kind of predict the tides that way if you know where the moon's going to be. Uh, Chris says, uh, or asks, does the moon the gravitational pull help slow Earth's rotation? It does. That's a great thing to bring up, Chris. And I brought that up before, um, gosh, in a past live stream. Uh, we've done so many of these, I couldn't even tell you which one it was. Um, but uh, it, ha it is slowing Earth's uh, rotation. Uh, let's see. I wonder when I would have mentioned that. I'm going to try to quickly search it. Uh, so I, yeah, okay, yeah, that's the stream I talked about it. So um, I did a live stream on seasons and space time. And that a live stream, let's see, was, doo -doo 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 -doo. I believe that was September 21st. So if you want to learn more about, uh, if you want to learn more about that specifically, Chris, uh, how the Earth, and or how the moon slows the earth's rotation check out that live stream uh, but just to quickly answer your question it is slowing the earth's rotation in fact the time of the dinosaurs one day was 22 hours long so uh, between the dinosaurs and us the day has slowed quite a bit uh, it will not slow the earth completely um, uh, that would take longer than our solar system has before the sun dies <laughs> but great question chris thanks for asking that Eric says, uh, don't total solar, solar eclipses impact animal behavior? They do. In fact, I remember I was up at the river market in Kansas City watching, uh, and weirdly, right close to the eclipse, a bunch of birds landed on the roofs of buildings because uh, they thought it was nighttime. So uh, really, really interesting. Uh, and uh, I'm sure there are a lot of other stories uh, of other animals being affected and confused by that. Uh, Didi says, total solar eclipse silence was spooky. Yeah, there was kind of an eerie silence that happened during that, wasn't there? Super weird. Okay, so I mentioned that you can look up eclipses. Uh, so here's a cool website we can uh, hopefully post in the comments. Um, pull it up. Uh, Timeanddate.com uh, has uh, a lot of useful information uh, about times and dates, and it has a list of eclipses. So this will show us the next eclipses we can see. So that was the uh, partial lunar eclipse, a penumbral eclipse, uh, and that uh, shows you the visibility scope. So there's an annular eclipse actually left this year, but you'll only be able to see it if you're in the southern tip of South America. Let's zoom in here a little bit actually. Oh. Uh, let's see, there's a total lunar eclipse uh, that will be uh, in May of next year. It looks like, unfortunately, we won't be able to see all of it, though, here in North America. It's really going to be an Australia eclipse or Antarctica, if you happen to be there. Um, and there is a partial lunar eclipse that will happen in November of next year. Looks pretty close to complete, so it should be pretty spectacular. Uh, and uh, if things uh, continue, improve, continue, continue to improve uh, with the global situation, uh, then uh, hopefully uh, we will plan on doing a viewing event at Union Station, because for these I often set up my telescope at Union Station for free, and you can come and see these things for yourselves. Um, and it looks like May of 2022 there will be one to see as well. So anyway, you can look this up and you can find uh, the next uh, eclipse that you will see in your area. All right, so let's move right along. Woo, it's already 6.30. Uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying it. Uh, I know I'm having a good time. Uh, so um, let's see. I did want to mention earlier, I forget exactly where, but uh, the, our moon, uh, the big moon, was not the only uh, moon of Earth. We've had two temporary moons, asteroids that passed by the Earth and got kind of temporarily captured in Earth's orbit. There was one in 2006 that stuck around for a few months and then left, and then there's one currently sort of wobbling around the Earth. Uh, and it's a very small asteroid. It won't crash into us, but it, technically we could call it a natural satellite, although it's really a captured satellite. Let's talk about uh, the Earth's, or sorry, the Moon's formation. Uh, and to do that, we're going to load up uh, a piece of software that uh, is, of course, choosing to update right while I'm doing this live stream. Uh, okay, great, that didn't take long. Thank you, Gigabit Fiber. Um, so we're going to pull up Universe Sandbox, which we haven't pulled up in a while, uh, but it is a fun one. 
Oh, and it decided to go full screen on me. <laughs> Hold on one second, folks, as we do, 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 do. fix this. And I'm vamping. You guys doing well? I hope I, hopefully everybody had a good and safe uh, Thanksgiving. All right, there we go. Okay, I think that's good enough. So Universe Sandbox is a, a 3D a simulation software that lets us simulate um, uh, simulate things in space, basically simulate a gravitational uh, scenarios, essentially. So I'm going to talk about the formation of the moon. Now there are a couple of theories as to how the moon formed. Um, one theory is called the co-formation theory. And this theory basically involves the idea that a material early in our solar system, uh, which created the planets, was uh, drawn together to form the moon as well. So the Earth was formed at the beginning of our solar system when all the gas and dust left over from the sun's formation coalesced via gravity to form the planets. So some people think, well, maybe the moon's been around since then, and maybe it formed right alongside the Earth. And there's some merit to that. A moon like this would share a lot of the same composition as its parent planet. Um, and the moon does have a similar composition to the Earth, as we discussed. But it is uh, much less dense than Earth, so that theory seems kind of unlikely. Uh, there is the capture theory. And actually, we're going to go back over to Space Engine just briefly, because I want to go over to Saturn. Now, the capture theory is that Earth's gravitational uh, field captured a passing object, just like those small asteroids. Now, at the beginning of our solar system, there were a lot of larger uh, objects floating around, uh, and there's a better chance that uh, those could have been captured. Um, but I did want to uh, show... I'll turn on the dwarf moons here. Uh, that uh, this there's precedent for this because many of the moons of our uh, sorry many of the planets in our solar system the outer ones especially have a lot of captured moons so the moons that are close to planets like Saturn orbit in a flat plane just like our solar system and these inner moons were formed with our solar system but the outer moons were captured asteroids objects that were passing by the planets and were captured by their gravitational field uh, in fact Mars's two moons were likely captured asteroids as well uh, Phobos and Deimos um, and they orbit very close to Mars. Um, and if we zoom in on them, we can see that unlike the moon, they are very small, rocky bodies. Uh, wow, my nose is very red on this stream, I'm just noticing. Uh, my heat just kicked on. I'm going to chalk it up to that. It's a chilly day today, so we're going to go Rudolph style for the rest of the stream. I <laughs> hope you don't mind. Um, so uh, there, this capture theory uh, has some merit as well. Um, as, as I said, there is precedent for the inner planets to have captured moons. Mars did, uh, as I have shown you here. Um, but uh, moons like this are often very oddly shaped, like uh, the moon I just showed you, Phobos there. Uh, or sorry, that was Deimos, rather. And our moon is very spherical, so that doesn't seem to really hold merit. And now, as I mentioned, Earth does sometimes capture uh, those sort of mini moons. Um, and uh, as I showed you there in the PowerPoint just a second ago. Uh, but both of these theories are probably not true. The prevailing theory, uh, the biggest theory that most scientists kind of lean towards right now, of course there's really no way of proving these theories, but uh, what most of the scientific communi community kind of agrees on is that most likely the ex explanation for the existence of our moon or the creation of our moon is the giant impact hypothesis, which is another great band name. So I'm going to claim that one as well. I've claimed a lot of band names during these streams. Sorry about that. So uh, this theory states that the moon was formed when an, uh, oops, wrong one, when um, a large object, probably the size of Mars, crashed into the Earth. Uh, so let's open up a blank simulation here, and we are going to add the Earth. So we're just going to pop the Earth right there. It's spinning around. It's doing its thing. Uh, so here's the Earth, and uh, let's see. Uh, oh, man, my computer is starting to take off like an aircraft carrier. Um, this software is very taxing. Did anybody remember that time I set up a supernova on my computer and it grinded the live stream to a halt? Let's make sure that doesn't happen this time. So uh, start uh, start waving in the comments if uh, this live stream starts to, starts to get really angry. Uh, but we're going to give this a shot. Wow, I don't know if that's coming up on stream, but my computer is like really ramping up those fans. Um, I just upgraded my computer. All right, anyway, so this hypothesis, as I said, uh, postulates that a large object, now this object uh, has uh, been named Thea uh, after, uh, let's see, uh, 
So Thea is a, another Greek titaness and goddess of brilliance and shining light, who was the mother of the pre-Olympian gods Helios, uh, who was in charge of the sun, Selene, uh, Selene who was uh, representing the moon, and Eos, who represented the dawn. So they named it Thea as sort of the mother of the moon, so to speak. Uh, and so this idea is that Thea collided with the earth. And we're going to try to... So uh, in Universe Sandbox, you can launch objects at other objects. So I'm going to launch Mars at woo, the earth. And that was probably... Uh oh that probably wasn't the uh I wanted to kind of launch it at sort of a sideways angle. So we're going to we're going to try a new simulation here. So let's add the earth again. What I wanted to Oh. <laughs> I just launched the earth into space. <laughs> let's do that again. All right. Uh we're having fun here, guys. Uh okay, we want earth to be standing still and we want to launch Mars. Now I want to launch Mars at kind of an angle. In fact, I'm going to turn the auto launch velocity off and let's see how well this does. So I'm going to launch Mars, hopefully to kind of graze just by the edge of the Earth. Um, all right, that worked a little better. So what happened, we think, is that a very large object like Mars crashed into the Earth and it kicked up a ton of debris. And that debris started floating around and over millions of years, that debris coalesced via gravity to form Mars. Now, it may not happen on our simulation, um, because, you know, we can't uh, recreate this primordial universe, but you can imagine how these objects floating around the Earth could have gotten pulled together via gravity uh, and uh, formed uh, a large object like the Moon. And so this is the most prevailing theory, uh, and it does make a lot of sense because the moon's lower density uh, could be explained by the fact that this object, Thea, carved off a bunch of the Earth's crust, and uh, that crust is what formed uh, the moon, and the Earth's crust is a lot less dense than its core, uh, so that does kind of make sense. I kind of want to try that just one more time. You guys mind? Uh, just because, you know, I like crashing stuff into the Earth. It's very cathartic right now. I don't know if anybody else feels like they'd like to crash something into the Earth, but I sure would. Um, so let's try to get it like right on the edge. Let's see. I wonder if that'll graze by. Okay, that's a little bit better. Not really though. It didn't kick up as much debris. That's okay. Hopefully you guys can kind of imagine uh, what that scenario would be like. Uh, now after, here let's let my computer <laughs> chill out a little bit. Um, after uh, the moon formed, it uh, cooled for a while and then there were a number of uh, other uh, events that uh, impacted its geology. Uh, so here's a really cool video that uh, NASA put together um, uh, from the Office of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which we'll discuss, uh, hopefully, if we have time. Oh man, I feel like I needed two live streams for the moon. Hopefully you guys are still enjoying this. I'm not even sure how many people are watching. Maybe nobody is. But uh, to the one person who's still watching, hope you're enjoying it. Um, so this is a video that's going to show us uh, after the moon was formed, it was uh, very hot, as you can imagine, uh, a bunch of debris being carved off of a planet would be. And over millions of years, billions of years really, it cooled down. Uh, but there were a number of impacts uh, that uh, caused a lot of uh, a lot of surface details. Uh, during the late heavy bombardment, which was a period about 4 billion years ago, uh, we think due to a bunch of large planets moving around our solar system, a lot of objects crashed into the moon and formed a lot of impact basins. Uh, this is where a lot of the craters came from. This is also likely where the Maria came from. So on the moon, there are dark regions that uh, are named Maria, which means oceans. Um, and as you can see, these lava fields covered much of the moon after this, these impacts from the late heavy bombardment. And those lava fields cooled down uh, to uh, eventually form uh, these dried lake beds, these maria as they're called, as well as some very wide and ancient craters. Um, and then uh, over uh, millions more years, this lava did eventually cool down. But there were a number of other impacts that happened throughout our solar system. And uh, since the moon uh, does not have an atmosphere, it does not uh, have any uh, erosion effects. So a lot of these features are, have been able to stick around. Um, so uh, we can see there are uh, the most famous uh, region of the moon there, that very large Maria. Uh, and then so for the uh, four or yeah, four-ish billion years after that, there were a number of other bombardments from other particles in our solar system as the planets were kind of finalizing their formation, and this caused many of the craters. The largest crater, crater on the moon is Tycho, uh, and that impact was about 108 million years ago, so the dinosaurs would have seen that one for sure. And so uh, there are a lot of the craters, and of course scientists have uh, different designations for these craters since we can actually study uh, their age and determine that 
uh, by studying material uh, returned from the moon as well as uh, information gathered from orbiters, which we'll discuss later. So there's a little bit of information about how the moon got formed. Now, of course, humans eventually uh, came around and uh, the moon is so bright uh, and uh, it is, uh, you know, one of the largest things in the night in the nighttime sky. Often it is the largest thing. Uh, and since the dawn of human consciousness, we've been fascinated and drawn to it as a species. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, humanity's uh, ancient history with the moon. Uh, real quick, though, I wanted to jump in. We do have a question from Mandy saying, does the moon's gravity have any effect or cause earthquakes? Great question, Mandy. Uh, so the moon's gravity does not cause earthquakes on the Earth. However, there are moonquakes due to the moon's uh, somewhat still geologically active core. And we've discovered those uh, with instruments that the Apollo uh, uh, missions left on the moon. Uh, but the moon's gravity does affect the tides, as I mentioned before. So it does create the tides as the moon pulls on the oceans, uh, and the moon is slowing the Earth's rotation down very slowly. Okay, so let's talk about our human relationship with the moon. So um, there are five... Uh, there are five naked eye planets that we can see with our eyes, and that is Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, and then, of course, we can see the sun and the moon. So those five celestial objects inspired ancient people throughout history. Um, and the moon was, of course, no, ex no exception. Uh, to the Greeks, the moon was represented by Artemis, who was the twin sister of the Olympian sun god Apollo. Uh, she was also the goddess of childbirth and fertility, as well as the hunt. Uh, for the Egyptians, it was Thoth, who was portrayed as a wise counselor who solved many disputes, was credited also by his followers as the inventor of writing in the 365-day calendar. And then uh, to the Hindus, uh, Chandra represented the moon. Now, the first widely used calendars used the sun to track the year and the moon's phases to divide the year up into equal parts. Uh, and that's actually where the word moon comes from. This is the oldest lunar calendar, by the way, uh, which dates back about 34,000 years. It was found carved in bone. Very cool. But this uh, right here, this top part is a lunar calendar. The word moon actually uh, is related to the word, word month. They have the same etymological origin. They come from Old English, Mona, and the Proto-Germanic Menon. Uh, and uh, also the word, uh, Latin word mensis means month. So month and moon are synonymous and they have been uh, cor correlated. Um, and uh, that 27 day lunar cycle was the designation of a month for the longest time. Uh, this is also where the word Monday comes from, a little fun fact not a lot of people know about. Um, so uh, the, wow, how did that, sheesh, that, uh, well these charts did not show up very well, whoops. Let's, uh, is that how they're supposed supposed to look? Well, okay. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> um, uh, that's okay. Sorry about that. Well, I had uh, some lovely charts showing word origins, but I will just tell you about it. That's okay. Um, so let's go back over here. So uh, basically all the days of the week were originally named after uh, the visible planets, uh, the moon and the sun. That's a lovely seven number. The Latin, uh, Latin language and Greek language uh, organized this. So Sunday was the day of the sun, Monday the day of the moon, Tuesday was the day of Mars, Wednesday was the day of Mercury, Thursday was the day of Jupiter, Friday day of Venus, and Saturday day of Saturn. Now the remnants of this can be seen in the Romance languages, languages derived from Latin. Uh, for example, uh, Spanish, uh, uh, Domingo, uh, Lunes, Martes, Miércoles, Jueves, uh, Vernes, and Sabado. So Miércoles, day of uh, Mercury, Martes, day of Mars, Jueves, day of Jupiter. So you can see that kind of correlation there. Now as for the English words, those come from uh, the Germ Germanic calendar, um, which are still based on gods, but different gods. Uh, but Monday is still actually associated with the moon god. Uh, the Norse Germanic uh, mythological uh, god Mani is the personification of the moon. Uh, throughout history, the moon was blamed for a lot of weird things. Uh, it was blamed for causing insanity. That's where the term lunatic actually comes from. Uh, luna uh, is the Latin base of moon, uh, the Latin base word of moon, I should say, <laughs> Latin moon base. Uh, and uh, now, so this was uh, ancient history. And so the, the, the moon, as well as all those celestial bodies, were tied to our calendars. Now, fast forwarding a little bit, uh, when scientists, uh, you know, early scientists started studying the moon. A lot of these were astrologers, um, but when they started looking at it, uh, they thought that the moon, along with the other uh, planets and celestial spheres, were uh, heavenly bodies, as they were considered. They were thought to be perfectly spherical. It wasn't until Galileo Galilei uh, challenged this notion when he pointed his telescope at the moon uh, and actually sketched it for the first time. So here are Galileo's sketches of the moon. And this is a fun fact. I didn't realize this until I was putting the stream together, but um, the first time Galileo looked at the moon through his telescope and sketched 
his first drawing of it was November 30th, 1609. So how's that for a coincidental anniversary? Uh, that This is uh, the anniversary of Galileo's uh, sketch of the moon. So that works out quite well that this stream happened today. I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, the next year in 1610, he noted in his starry messenger uh, writing that the moon's surface was in fact rough and rocky with dark, flat, low-lying regions and brighter highlands. So seeing the moon up close or through the telescope at least challenged this notion uh, that these bodies in space were perfectly spherical. And the moon was kind of the first thing that challenged that notion. Uh, astronomers in this era uh, still didn't really understand the moon. They thought those dark regions were seas, which is why they were named Maria. And they even thought that plants and maybe even animals lived on the moon. Um, Writers uh, throughout the uh, you know 19th and 20th century imagined uh, the moon and trips to it. Uh, Jules Verne's 1865 From the Earth to the Moon, a famous example of that, and the 1902 French short film A Trip to the Moon as well, a great and uh, famous example. Got another question from Eric saying, what happened to the debris that was ejected from the impacts? Why no rings? That's a great question. So in reference to the moon's formation and all those impacts uh, crashing into the moon, uh, so a lot of those impacts um, were uh, very uh, at a very low angle, so a lot of that debris uh, didn't have enough escape velocity to, to get into orbit, basically. So a lot of it ended up crashing back down onto the moon. And also, rings are often uh, formed um, during during uh, moon, moon disintegration. So we talked about Saturn's moon a while back during the Saturn live stream, which you can find if you check out our July sixth live stream. And um, rings are often formed when a moon that's already in a stable orbit disintegrates, so that material stays in that stable orbit. Uh, so that material wouldn't have been a stable orbit, uh, and it likely just crashed back down to the Earth. But great question, Eric. So, I found my place. Uh, so that is sort of our, uh, our, our historical understanding of the moon, but of course all this changed with, with the advent of uh, rocket technology. So, um, starting in the uh, 1950s, um, our, uh, the, the rocket-powered space travel era was ushered in, and for the first time, scientists could really uh, get um, actual scientific information from our nearest celestial neighbor from a much closer vantage point. So the first uh, real example, uh, first mission and probe to the moon was uh, about two years after Sputnik, the Soviet Union launched Luna 3, which was the third lunar uh, uh, orbiter mission, and it was the first probe to send back close-up images of the moon. So this is the first close-up picture ever taken of the moon. Uh, not amazing, but remember, con considering this was 1959, still pretty cool. Fast forwarding, of course, uh, the, uh, our, you know, NASA and the American astronauts caught up very quickly and overtook the Soviet Union in the space race, and we sent a human to the moon for the first time with Apollo 11. We did actually send humans to the moon, I wanted to mention. We did not fake the moon landing. If you want to know why we didn't fake the moon landing and proof for it, check out our July 20th live stream where I talked all about movie astronomy. We talked about uh, how many movies get science right and wrong, but I also did a little aside at the beginning talking about how we know for a fact that the moon landing could not have been faked. Basically, the crux of the argument, the too long I didn't read of it was um, that Back then, it would have been more difficult to fake the moon landing and the uh, the video footage of it than it would have been to actually just go to the moon. So uh, take my word for it or take my live stream's word for it, July 20th, check out that live stream. Uh, so when we started exploring the moon with probes and then eventually astronauts, we learned so much more about uh, the moon's surface. Before Apollo 11 and the Eagle lander touched down, astronauts were actually unsure about what the surface would be like. It's kind of crazy that we sent astronauts to the moon not even knowing if their spacecraft would just kind of fall through the lunar dust. Astronauts weren't sure, and a lot of scientists and engineers actually thought that it might be so dusty and fluffy that the spaceship would just sink right down into the dust. Um, but it turns out that layer of dust was not that deep. Um, here is a picture of a footprint, I believe Neil Armstrong's, and you can see the dust was only a couple centimeters thick, so that eagle managed to land just fine. We call this dust regolith, by the way. Uh, all in all, during the six successful lunar landing missions, we brought back 842 pounds of lunar rock, and scientists are still making discoveries about the moon from it to this day. A lot of discoveries we made during the Apollo program, for example, were that those oceans, those maria, were of course not made of water. They were actually dried and cooled lava lake beds. We could take samples from them and uh, learn about that. Uh, materials from the highlands, on the other hand, turned out to be made of a, a plagioclast feldspar. Hopefully I got that right, uh, which is a common rock building mineral on Earth. Uh, and uh, um, now... Uh, 
You know, another thing we've learned about the moon, of course, is that there is no life on the moon. It's a very hostile place with extreme temperature changes and no atmosphere. It is kind of funny, though, that uh, even though we were pretty sure the moon was lifeless, uh, the astronauts were still forced to quarantine for three weeks uh, in this uh, Airstream trailer. There's the president saying hi to them. Um, so uh, I think we all know how that feels. <laughs> Uh, to be stuck in that tiny space. Uh, of course, uh, these quarantines didn't really last after the Apollo, first Apollo 11 mission because we figured out that there wasn't much to worry about there on the moon. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to this really cool uh, website. This is uh, apolloinrealtime.org. We can post a link to that in the comments section as well. And uh, this uh, was created last year when we celebrated the um, 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission. Uh, but they actually have modules for a lot of the other missions. And if you choose one of them, uh, it was happening in real time uh, when the mission was taking place. But uh, you can rewatch it uh, and you can start at a T minus one. And basically, it'll go through the entire launch. Uh, and with video footage and interactives, and you can actually look at, uh, listen to different mission control channels and see different images of the launch, and you can see the actual, the real transcripts uh, of mission control as they talk about it. Um, so this is a really, really awesome uh, tool and resource and another really fun way to just kind of kill a weekend, just to scroll through all of these. You can see uh, the full mission timeline, all the highlights here as well, um, and you can basically watch that whole mission. And I'm tempted to just Kind of let this, uh, okay, I guess I can fast forward to uh, T minus 10. There we go. So we'll actually, so the pictures will scroll by here on the right and the video footage is on the left. It was pretty fun last summer kind of following along this in real time. You could actually kind of tune in and it was almost like they were live streaming the moon landing. Um, <clears throat> so really, really awesome, really, really awesome resource. Be sure to check that out. It's a really fun one. NASA just has so many amazing things. Really this this whole live stream uh, for the past eight months has been me showing off cool NASA stuff. So um, after the Cold War thawed, uh, the moon was kind of less interesting to scientists, unfortunately, uh, and exploration of the moon waned. Of course, Apollo 17 was the final moon mission. At that point, uh, the focus turned uh, to low Earth orbit and building space stations. Uh, we partnered with the Soviet Union after the Cold War ended. Uh, and we, of course, eventually built the International Space Station. And if you want to learn more about the International Space Station, check out the October 19th live stream where I constructed an International Space Station from Legos. And we talked about all the different modules, its history, and the history of other space stations as well. So check out that one on October 19th. Really fun live stream I did. Um, now, we have sent other probes uh, to the moon. Uh, for example, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was launched in 2009, uh, June of 2009, and it sent back 192 terabytes of data back to Earth. It made a 3D map of the moon down to the uh, 100 millimeter uh, resolution, and it even took uh, half, a mil or half a meter, sorry, 100 meter resolution, and it took half a meter resolution images of the Apollo landing sites for the proof that we did officially land on the moon. In fact, there's a great uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter website that NASA put together, and it even has uh, all of the uh, lunar landing sites. So there you can see actually the uh, paths that the astronauts walked on in the Apollo 11 landing site. So photos of the landing site right there for you. Uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter also carried the L-Cross, which was actually kind of like a missile that we sent to shoot the moon. What it did is it uh, crashed into the moon and created an artificial uh, cloud of debris that the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was able to take pictures of and learn more about the composition of the moon that way. There was also the uh, Artemis uh, 1 and 2 missions in July of 2011. They are uh, orbiting the moon in Lagrange points, which we've talked about before, stable orbits where they don't really move. They just sort of look at the moon in a one space or one direction. Um, and they are studying the effects of solar wind on the lunar surface. There's also the Chinese U-2 rover, um, which uh, was launched in December of 2013. Uh, and it's nicknamed was the Jade Rabbit, uh, and it was meant to explore the lunar surface for three months. Unfortunately, though, its solar panels failed at the end of its second day, and now it survived its first lunar night of 14 days, but it began to lose power during its second lunar night. I wanted to bring this up because it's kind of a sad story. Um, the uh, state-run social media uh, over in China likes to personify a lot of these types of things uh, to kind of generate national pride, uh, and so there was a social media account on uh, Weibo, which is kind of the uh, their equivalent of Twitter. And so this rover had its own Twitter account and it was tweeting in the first person. So at first it was tweeting about how excited it was to go do science. But then as it was starting to have difficulties, it was tweeting about it and it was saying like, like I'm having some issues, but my scientists, I'm sure will figure it out. Uh, but then as it became clear that it was not going to uh, regain power, um, it started to kind of 
uh, comment on its own demise, which was a little depressing. Um, it started to talk about how uh, the sun was setting and it was starting to feel cold. Uh, and then the little uh, Jade Rabbit Rover said that it wasn't sad or afraid, but it was happy to be part of such an exciting adventure. And it finally signed off with good night, Earth, and good night, humanity, which I had to be honest, when that was happening, like I kind of teared up a little bit. It was a little sad, a little a little moon rover that could be. Um, now, since then, China sent a couple uh, sequels to the U2 Jade Rabbit rover, and they have had more success. In fact, uh, recently, uh, just about a week ago, uh, China launched the Shang-5 mission, uh, which was the first sample return mission uh, since Apollo, and it actually is orbiting the moon right now. And last I read, they're planning on attempting a landing tomorrow. So if you haven't yet, be sure to like and subscribe to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's Facebook page, and we will post up updates about this exciting landing. Um, now, what about the future? Uh, are we going to go back to the moon? Well, a lot of scientists would love to go back to the moon, uh, and a lot of um, a lot of people would love to uh, kind of form a permanent base on the moon. You know, uh, they, that excitement during the space race uh, really generated a lot of interest in science. Uh, and going back to the moon could be a way uh, to bring that back. And NASA has announced plans to uh, start going back to the moon or planning on going back to the moon. The Artemis missions, which were announced last year, uh, are claiming to plan to put uh, a humans on the moon in, by 2024. So hopefully that will happen. Uh, their website here you can check out, uh, which will give you uh, all sorts of information about this future program. Um, and... Uh, you can learn more about our plans to hopefully go back to the moon. And right now, NASA is developing the space launch system with the Orion capsule. Uh, and um, there are new generations of spacesuits you can learn about here. So uh, NASA is uh, very excited to be working on this. A part of the excitement of other companies like SpaceX taking on low Earth orbit is that NASA can focus on deep space exploration. And this Artemis program will hopefully be uh, that for us in the future. Well, folks, that is pretty much what I had for you today, all about the moon, all about uh, its past, humanity's past, looking at it uh, and our exploration of it and the future. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this. I'm not seeing any uh, outstanding comments or shout outs, but while I vamp and close out, uh, now is your chance to post any last second questions or comments in the comments section. Um, but in the meantime, I just wanted to thank everybody again for supporting Union Station and these live streams. Like I said, this is our 50th live stream, and I'm so thankful for uh, to all of you for your support. I've, I've had a ton of fun doing these uh, and it's been um, really great this year kind of uh, you know making lemonade out of this situation uh, and hopefully um, you've enjoyed this sort of new aspect of the planetarium uh, and if you've been enjoying these live streams but have not yet visited the planetarium be sure to do that uh, either now or when things uh, are uh, safer and you feel more comfortable coming um, but we would love to have you at the planetarium and hopefully with all these new exciting topics we've covered in these live streams we may bring some of that back to the planetarium so if you're interested in that maybe turning some of these topics we've covered into a full planetarium show that could be a lot of fun then let us know and don't forget all of our past live streams are on our youtube channel just search for arvin gottlieb planetarium on youtube and you can find all of them we've covered so many fun topics we've covered we've done live streams on many of the planets in our solar system uh from mars to jupiter to saturn uh, the inner infernos of mercury and venus and next week we will be covering the ice giants uranus and neptune so we're going to round out our full solar system tour uh, this uh, year for all these live streams. But we covered a lot of other fun topics. I've talked about other probes and rovers. Uh, we've set up a telescope in the living room of my apartment. So if you want to learn about telescopes, uh, which telescopes to buy, how to set them up, uh, now would be a great time, especially with the holidays coming up and gift giving uh, coming up. Uh, check out the May 6th live stream where I teach you how to set up a telescope and use it. We've talked about the golden record, the, Voyage, uh, the uh, messages we sent on the Voyager space probes out to the universe. We've done a lot of really fun pop culture shows. I did a show um, uh, about uh, movies and their uh, relationships with space, uh, different movies and how good or bad they were with their astronomy science. That was on July 20th. I did a live stream about TV shows as well. We talked about a Doctor Who and Star Trek, uh, and that was uh, the September 28th live stream. We created a comet in my living room. I actually made a comet from ingredients you can buy at the grocery store, so check that out. Uh, that was the July 13th live stream. And... Uh, 
And we've done uh, all sorts of other really fun live streams, and we've got a bunch of comments flooding in here at the end, which is so great. And so we're going to round out by just reading some of these comments. Uh, Kelly says, this was great. Thanks. Thanks so much for watching, Kelly. I'm so glad you enjoyed this. Cindy says, thanks as well. Thanks for tuning in, Cindy. Uh, Mandy says, cool stuff. Thank you. You're welcome, Mandy, and thanks so much for watching. Your support is so appreciated. Casey says, awesome stream as usual. Thanks, Patrick and Union Station. Thanks for watching, Casey, one of our regulars as well. It's so awesome seeing people tuning in every week. That's so great. Uh, Patience says, uh, he's giving me a round of emoji applause. Thanks so much, Patience. A great live stream. High five to the bird as well. You hear that, Phoebe? You got a high five. Uh, Lauren says, congratulations on your 50th show. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you watching. Uh, Chris, uh, one of our top fans, says, if the moon is moving, oh, is asking, if the moon is moving away at four centimeters a year, will the moon eventually leave its orbit and float away? Great question, Chris. So that's right. The moon is getting further away every year. Uh, but uh, that uh, you don't have to worry about, Chris, because the moon will not get far enough away for it to uh, leave the orbit. In fact, it is decelerating in its exit um, as the Earth is sort of pulling on it. And basically, the energy is transferring transferring and that's why the earth is slowing down as well these are all related things so the moon will just get further away uh very slowly but it will never actually leave this system but that's a really great question chris uh in fact um other than these transient small asteroid -like moons that sort of swoop in and hang around for a while and then leave again um, i'm not aware of any moons that have left the orbits of planets although i guess we really don't know or can't really tell if there has been a moon of say jupiter that stuck around for a while and left i guess you could say the moon that disintegrated to form saturn's rings could be considered a moon that left uh the orbit although it's still technically orbiting but that's a really great question chris a question that kind of stumped me which i really appreciate always good to be challenged emily says another awesome show thanks for watching emily i appreciate your support as well uh, robert uh, is liking this show as well eric says great job as always amazingly interesting stephanie says thanks great job and that i think will round out our stream today once again thank you so much for watching i've been your planetarium specialist patrick hess tune in next week monday at 6 p.m we'll be taking a deep dive into the outer ice giants uranus and neptune we got a fun slate of streams planned for the rest of the year as well and into next year so be sure to mark your calendars every monday night 6 p.m we'll see you there see you next time folks Bye bye